Hi, I'm Pamela Toller. I'm the author of Heroines of Mercy Street, The Real Nurses of the Civil War, and also of Women Warriors, An Unexpected History. They're both stories about women that you probably never heard of, but you really should. Thank you. I'm going to apologize at the beginning. My voice is not so good. So if I lose it all together, we'll just do the best we can. Luckily, you've got a good mic, um, so we should be fine. The thing I should have had on that uh, biography, given what your next speaker is going to be talking about, is I grew up in Springfield, Missouri, and I got my first taste of the Civil War at Wilson's Creek Battlefield where I participated in living history programs demonstrating two very different things, quilting and shooting a muzzle-loading rifle. <laughs> but tonight, what I'm gonna be talking about is nurses in the Civil War. Who they were, what they did, what challenges they faced. And to some extent, I'm going to be talking about Civil War nurses through the experience of one particular woman. Mary Finney von Olhausen. But before I start, I do want to offer one caveat. My book focused on women who nursed at Mansion House Hospital, which was a union hospital in Alexandria, Virginia. So that tonight, I'm going to be focusing on women who nursed for the Union Army, and for the most part, women who nursed in the Eastern Theater. Um, the Confederate experience was different in some substantial and really fascinating ways. And if anyone has questions about women who nursed for the Confederacy, I'll do my best to answer those when we get to the Q&A at the end. That said, whether you're talking about North or South, the first thing you need to know about Civil War nurses is that nursing was not yet a skilled profession in the mid-19th century. And it, wasn't a job for a respectable woman. Um, for the most part, nursing for pay, particularly nursing in a hospital, was something that just nice girls didn't do. Now, as a practical matter, most women had some day-to-day -day experience of what I call domestic nursing. They could expect that at some point in their lives, they were going to have to take care of a very ill family member or an ailing neighbor. But nursing in that matter was not a matter of providing medical care. It was a matter of providing comfort. Nursing meant keeping a patient clean, making sure he ate, took liquids, took what medications were available. And mostly it meant watching, being there in case something was needed. Now, there were some women who worked as private nurses in wealthy homes. They were basically temporary domestic servants, and they served the same function that family members served in taking care of the sick in a less well-to-do home. Um, they often were older. They frequently were widows. 
and they were drawn from the same social class as other domestic servants. It was a huge step down the social scale from private nurses to women who nursed in a hospital. And that was in part because of the nature of the hospitals themselves. Um, general hospitals at the time were charity institutions. There weren't very many of them. They existed only in the largest cities. And while we would like to think that a charity hospital would have been well run, in fact, general hospitals in the 19th century were like other charitable institutions in the 19th century. Think orphanages, asylums, workhouses. They were dirty, dangerous, smelly places that many people rightly regarded as death traps. So that even in a large city, family members took care of ailing relatives at home, if it was at all possible. Only the very poor or the very desperate went to a hospital when they were ill. As a result of that, the women who were willing to work as nurses in hospitals tended to be as desperate as the patients they cared for. Hospital nursing was a job for women who didn't have many options left. For example, in Bellevue Hospital in New York, most of the nurses were what were known as 10-day women. These were women who were arrested for public drunkenness or disorderly conduct and were sentenced to 10 days in the workhouse. Once they sobered up, they were given the option of having that sentence paroled in exchange for working as a nurse in the Bellevue wards for 30 days. Now, the fact that anyone takes that deal tells us two things. First, it tells us that the conditions in the workhouse were really bad. But it also tells us that the nurses at Bellevue were not there because they had a vocation. These were not angels of mercy. Um, okay, there we go. Um, British advocate, nursing advocate Florence Nightingale summed up the public perception of hospital nurses when she described them as women who were too old, too weak, too drunken, too dirty, too stolid, or too bad to do anything else. That perception of nursing began to change just a few years before the Civil War. And it changed in large part because of Florence Nightingale herself. Her heroic work in the Crimean War in 1854 caught the public imagination. The newspapers called her the lady with the lamp and she threw open windows. She scrubbed dirty floors and equally dirty men or at least arranged for them to be scrubbed by others. She fought with army officers and army doctors and the British Army's medical director in order to get them to cooperate with her. And she saved lives. When she published her book Notes on Nursing a few years later, it became a bestseller, not just in Great Britain, but also in the United States. So when the Civil War came and there was a need for nursing, there were women who were eager to follow her example. Since this is a group of Civil War buffs, I don't really need to tell you this next part, but just in case there are a few guests here who don't have this engraved on their hearts, immediately after the fall of Fort Sumter, President Lincoln called for 75,000 militia volunteers to put down what he described as a state of insurrection. The response was overwhelming. Tens of thousands of men enlisted. What this group may not know is that Lincoln also had volunteers from a source he never expected. That was women who wanted to serve their country. And the first woman to officially volunteer was Dorothea Dix. She was a 59-year-old reformer 
who for the 20 years prior to the war had worked to improve the treatment of paupers, the mentally ill, and prisoners. As far as Americans were concerned, if there was one woman in the United States who knew how medical institutions worked, Dorothea Dix was that woman. Dix was visiting friends in Trenton, New Jersey for a long overdue rest when she got the news that Fort Sumter had fallen. She immediately repacked, got on the train, headed to Washington, D.C. She arrived at the Capitol on the evening of April 19th, and she found the city on high alert because the Pratt Street riots had happened in Baltimore earlier that day. So there were pickets guarding public buildings, and there were soldiers billeted at the White House in anticipation of a Confederate attack before morning. A less determined woman might have said, you know, I think I'm just going to check into a hotel and I'll talk to someone in the morning. Dix went straight to the White House. Now, if another woman had appeared at the White House that night, she might have been turned away, even though security measures were a little looser then than they are now. But Dix was preceded by a well-earned reputation as a humanitarian, a crusader, and most importantly, as a woman who got things done. She was used to working with powerful politicians. They were used to working with her. In fact, there were probably men at the White House that night who had worked with her to try to pass a bill about the treatment of the mentally ill. So even with the threat of a Confederate army at the door, she was given a warm welcome and a fair hearing for what was really a revolutionary proposal. She volunteered her services to create a corps of women nurses modeled on the women who nursed with Florence Nightingale. To understand just how radical that proposal was, you need to know how the Army Medical Bureau handled the question of nursing prior to the Civil War. Um, because remember, nursing, not yet a profession, something respectable women don't do. So when the Army's Medical Bureau needed nurses, they called on convalescent enlisted men who were not yet well enough to go back to their military duties, but were too well to just take up a bed. And left to its own devices, the Army would have done nothing to change that. Um, so Dix's proposal really required a fundamental change in how the Army handled nursing. Four days after Dix volunteered, Secretary of War Simon Cameron accepted her proposal, much to the horror of the head of the Army's Medical Bureau. In June, she was appointed the Superintendent of Women Nurses for the Union Army, first federal executive position to be held by a woman. You know, there was some initial confusion about how nurses were to be recruited and about the extent of her authority. The Medical Bureau made a few inept attempts to undermine that authority. And in fact, questions about just what she was authorized to do continued throughout the war. But Dix herself had no doubts about what she wanted to do, and she knew exactly what kind of women she wanted for that new medical corps. It's got to be said, her requirements for who would be a nurse were not just based on the realities of working in army hospitals. There was a certain amount of her personal prejudices involved. She required two letters of reference that would testify to an applicant's morality, integrity, seriousness, and capacity to care for the sick. She didn't ask whether an applicant had any training or experience because she assumed that no respectable applicant would have any experience beyond taking care of a family member, and she didn't want nurses who weren't respectable. She only took women between the ages of 30 and 50. Neatness, order, sobriety, and industry were required characteristics. Education was a nice extra. 
Basically, she wanted women who were matronly, both in appearance and in fact, but they still had to be strong enough to turn a full-grown man in his bed. And it turned out to be surprisingly easy to find them. The largest number of women volunteered in July 1861 after the Battle of Bull Run. But women continued to volunteer as nurses well into 1864. By one estimate, more than 20,000 women served as nurses on the Union side. And that's not including women who nursed on an ad hoc basis, you know, women who lived near a hospital and would sometimes drop in in the afternoon to, to help. Those were tended to be called lady visitors rather than nurses. Or women who came to the battlefront to care for a wounded husband or son and then stayed to take care of other men. Despite Dix's cookie cutter vision of who her nurses should be. In fact, the women who volunteered were as diverse as the United States itself. There were teenaged girls, middle-aged widows and grandmothers, society bells, factory girls and farm wives, teachers, reformers and nuns, free African Americans and escaped slaves, Mayflower descendants and newly arrived immigrants. Some of them were, in fact, inspired by Nightingale's notes on nursing. Some were driven by religious zeal. The members of the United States Christian Commission, for instance, were as concerned with saving soldiers' souls as with healing their bodies. Some women volunteered because of financial need, often caused by the absence of a husband or a father in the war. But many, maybe even most, volunteered in part, at least, because of that same desire for patriotic action that led young men to enlist by the thousands in the first rush of enthusiasm for the war. Louisa May Alcott, for instance, not yet the famous author of Little Women. Alcott was eager to be involved in the war from the very beginning. Soon after the fall of Fort Sumter, she wrote in her diary, I long to be a man, but as I can't fight, I will content myself with working for those who can. Many women agreed with her. That brings me to Mary Finney von Olmhausen, whose story is in many ways typical of the women who joined Dorothea Dix's nursing corps. Anyone who watched the short-lived PBS series, Mercy Street, was introduced to the young and lovely Mary Finney, who was one of the major characters of the show. Well, let me introduce you to the historical Mary Finney von Olmhausen. <laughs> Mary Finney was born in Lexington, Massachusetts in 1818. She lived and worked on her family farm until she was 31, when her father died. And at that point, she and her unmarried sisters needed to find ways to support themselves. Mary didn't take any of the usual paths available to unmarried women at the time. Instead, she studied textile design at the newly founded Boston School of Design for Women. By all accounts, she was a talented designer. She soon found work in New England's booming textile mills. At that point, she probably had resigned herself to never marrying. Then she met the Baron von Olmhausen. Um, in addition to being a Baron, or maybe even in spite of being a Baron, Gustav von Olmhausen was a trained chemist, and he was a radical political reformer. He came to the United States after the failed political revolutions that rocked Europe in 1848, and he soon found work as a dye chemist in the same New Hampshire textile mill where Mary was working as a designer. They married in 1858 when Mary was 40. He died two years later. <laughs> 
After Gustav's death, she moved to Illinois, where she helped her younger brother farm a homestead on the prairie. Um, think little house on the prairie, only really, really dark. Um, it was a hard life. They were very isolated. And as rumors of the possibility of war began to reach the prairie, they became even more isolated because most of their neighbors were poor Southerners who had moved west in search of land. And they disagreed with the Finneys about the political situation in fundamental ways, particularly about slavery. Mary was outspoken, she was opinionated, and she found it really hard not to fight with her neighbors over this subject. So from her perspective, it was almost, excuse me, a relief when war came and she could do something. She later said that she was inspired to volunteer by what she called that terrible affair at Bull Run. Now at that point, she'd been widowed for less than a year. And reading her memoir, I think it's possible that she also desperately wanted to leave the prairie and that she needed to find some hard, all-encompassing work to distract her from her grief. But whatever her reasons, like women all over the North, she wrote letters to anyone she knew who might be able to help her get a position with Dorothea Dix's new Army Nursing Corps, though she didn't go as far as the woman who wrote directly to President Lincoln. And then, like women all over the North who had written similar letters, she waited for a response. And she waited, and she waited. And after a year of no response, she decided she wasn't gonna wait anymore. So she packed herself back up, she got on the train, she went back to Massachusetts. And once she was in Massachusetts, she made personal contact with Dorothea Dix. Mary was exactly the kind of woman that Dix wanted for her nursing corps. An educated, unmarried, middle-aged, middle-class woman not glamorous, not conventionally pretty, with a taste for reform and a history of hard work. August 1862, roughly a year after she wrote that first letter, Mary got her first nursing assignment at Mansion House Hospital in Arlington, Virginia. She would continue to nurse at various hospitals throughout the war. You know, Mary's path was typical of a lot of women who joined Dix's Corps of Nurses, but that wasn't the only path that led to nursing. The Dix nurses were just the largest piece in a patchwork quilt of nurses drawn from different sources with different relationships to the Army. They really only made up about 15% of the whole. The women who looked the most like the Dix nurses were the women who nursed for the Sanitary Commission, the United States Sanitary Commission. They were similar because they worked with an organization and that organization had a formal relationship with the Army. The Sanitary Commission used nurses in two ways. Early on during the Peninsular Campaign, nurses worked on hospital transport ships that the Sanitary Commission ran as a vendor for the Union Army. And then later they needed nurses to staff specially built sanitary commission hospitals. The sanitary commission nurses were different from the Dix nurses in one important way. Most of them came from a very different social group. A solid core of them were New York socialites and people really wondered whether they were gonna be able to do this work, but they abandoned their hoops, they took the feathers off the hats, their hats and the lace off their cuffs they rolled up their sleeves, often on a shirt that they had stolen from a doctor, and they got to work and did some amazing things. One step further away from a formal relationship for the, to the Army, though, were women who ended up being assigned to regiments where their husbands were enlisted. This was really an informal process. It wasn't sanctioned by the Army Medical Corps or 
the Secretary of War. It happened at the level of the local militia. One of my favorite examples of this group are a woman named Estelle Johnson and her sister. Um, Johnson writes that when her husband and her brother-in-law went to the recruiting office, she and her sister went later and told the recruiting officer that if their husbands were going, they wanted to go too. And she's very clear that they really didn't expect this to work. So they were stunned when a week later the recruiting officer came back and told them that the colonel had said that even though no one had called for nurses, he wanted them to come. A month later, they were formally sworn in to the 4th Vermont Regiment, Company J, in the presence of the regiment's colonel, its major, and the governor of Vermont. And they remained with the regiment until their husbands were discharged later in the war. Finally, there were women who had no official affiliation with the army at all. They just showed up at the battlefield or attached themselves to a regiment and did what needed to be done. Clara Barton, who later founded the American Red Cross, is the best known of these, but she's by no means the only one. Cornelia Hancock, for instance, Hancock was a young Quaker woman who was determined to serve. Her brother-in-law was a Philadelphia doctor, and after the Battle of Gettysburg, he arranged for her to travel to Gettysburg along with some older family friends who had just been appointed to Dix's nursing corps. Now, one of the things about Dorothea Dix that drove people crazy was she had a habit of just showing up for random, unannounced inspections. And while Hancock was standing with her friends on the railroad platform, Dix appeared to check out her newly accepted nurses. She took one look at Hancock and said, nope, and just dismissed the possibility of her being a nurse on the grounds of her youth and rosy cheeks. Hancock's friends immediately began to argue with Dix about why the younger woman should be allowed to go. Hancock just walked away from the argument, got on the train, went to Gettysburg, and when she got there, she found the need was so great that no one cared about her age or her appearance. No matter what path women took to nursing, whether they were official army nurses or totally unofficial volunteers. Whether they worked in a hospital or on the battlefield, they all faced similar challenges. And the first was that, in many cases, their families didn't want them to go. For every woman who volunteered as a nurse, there was at least one who was held back by the disapproval of her family and friends, or just by society's assumptions about what was proper behavior for a lady. It was commonly believed that working in a hospital would coarsen even the most refined woman. Obviously, those aren't terms that we tend to think about these days. But one surgeon summed up this attitude when a woman named Harriet Dada arrived at his hospital. He told her, a lady ceases to be a lady when she becomes a nurse. Families worried. Um, they worried for all the reasons that most families worry when their child goes off into the world for the first time. But they also worried for two reasons that we don't generally worry. The first is a fear that their daughter's reputation would be ruined because of the well-known moral laxity in hospitals. And the second was a fear that their daughters would have to fight off sexual advances from their very ill, badly wounded patients. On the other hand, there were doctors who were fearful that their patients would have to fight off sexual advances from the nurses, whom many of them stigmatized as desperate old maids. In fact, one doctor wrote to Surgeon General William Hammond beseeching him beseech is his verb, not mine, beseeching him 
to issue an order that would prohibit nurses from throwing themselves into the arms of sick and wounded soldiers and lasciviously exciting their animal passions. Um, I assume he had met nurses who had in fact ceased to be ladies. So a woman overcame her family's objections or if she was old enough and independent enough chose to ignore them. She manages to successfully travel to her first assignment, not a small job. Travel was much more difficult at the time, made worse by the war, and for the most part women didn't have an experience of traveling alone, but she successfully gets to that first assignment and she found out the army didn't want her. Most of the doctors in the army's medical bureau opposed the use of women as nurses in military hospitals. They complained that women didn't have the upper body strength to do the job. They argued that women didn't have the training to do the job, unlike the convalescent enlisted men who were pressed into service on an ad hoc basis. Some of them expressed concerns about what one doctor described as the inevitable affront to female modesty in the rough atmosphere of the hospital. And doctors who took that approach typically then mentioned things like bedpans and catheters as examples of what women shouldn't be faced with. And when all other arguments failed, they fell back on that old classic that the army had never used women as nurses before, and they saw no reason to change their position now. As a result of this common attitude, meeting a hostile doctor was almost a rite of passage for nurses when they got to a new hospital. This is Georgiana Woolsey who nursed for the Sanitary Commission. Obviously, Dorothea Dix would never have accepted her. Um, she wrote later about the early days of the war, and this is how she sh described their shared experience of meeting hostile doctors. No one knows who did not watch the thing from the beginning. How much opposition, how much ill will, how much unfeeling want of thought these women nurses endured. Hardly a surgeon whom I can think of received or treated them with even common courtesy. Government had decided that women should be employed, and the army surgeons, unable therefore to close the hospitals against them, determined to make their lives so unbearable that they would be forced in self-defense to leave. It seemed a matter of cool calculation. We know von Olmhausen experienced what Woolsey described. The chief surgeon at Mansion House Hospital made an open attempt to force her out. He did not want a Dix nurse in his hospital. And if doctors were opposed to women nurses in general, they were even more opposed to Dix nurses because Dragon Dix, as her many detractors called her, was known to meddle. She didn't just pop up to inspect her nurses, she inspected hospitals, whether she had the authority or not. She looked for dirt, she looked for incompetence, she looked for corruption, and whether she found it or not, she picked fights with surgeons. Um, she did not play well with others, up and down the line. So Dr. Summers was determined to force von Olmhausen out, and he chose a very simple tactic, one that was used by other doctors as well, he just refused to give her a bed. That dissuaded some women. Von Olmhausen was pretty tough. For the first few weeks, she slept in the surgical ward on the floor next to her patients. And when a bed finally opened up, she just moved in and didn't wait for permission. The hardest challenges, though, were the ones presented by the work itself. On von Olmhausen's first night at Mansion House Hospital, the wounded from the Battle of Cedar Mountain poured through the door. The battle had been a military defeat for the Union. It was a medical debacle. Patients lay for several days in the August heat. When they were finally evacuated, they were 
exhausted, ragged, dehydrated, mud caked, bloody. Their bandages hadn't been changed since their wounds were dressed in the field. And some of their wounds weren't dressed at all because the field surgeons ran short of supplies. Von Olnhausen was literally standing in the hospital office waiting to meet Dr. Summers when the first wounded arrived. She didn't have a chance to find her way around the hospital. She didn't even have a chance to be told she didn't have a bed. She certainly didn't have a chance to learn her duties. An orderly showed her into the surgical ward. Someone told her what to do. No one told her how to do it. Now she had actually done a fair amount of domestic nursing, more than was typical for the time, in fact. But nothing she had done prepared her for the effects on the human body of cannon shells, bayonets, mini balls. She was faced with carnage she had not been able to imagine. And she was also faced with her own ignorance. In her letter home, she said she just wanted to throw herself down and give up. I mean, it was hopeless. What could she do to help them? She pulled herself together, something she did a lot over the course of the war, and decided the only thing she could do for them now was learn. She followed doctors and watched. She did her best to make men comfortable. And a few days later, when things were quieter, she convinced someone to teach her how to bandage a wound. And she got better at it. By the end of the war, the doctors who worked with her considered her indispensable. And in fact, several of them wrote a testimonial to that effect. Von Olmhausen's experience wasn't unusual. Many volunteers began nursing without even the most basic introduction to the work they were there to do. You know, women who had nursed a relative through measles, which was not a trivial task, or had helped set a broken leg, were faced with the chaos of crowded hospitals and a stream of broken bodies, you know, brains oozing from head wounds, jaws half shot off, gut wounds, perforated lungs, gangrenous limbs, not to mention the illnesses that plagued the army camps and their attendant floods of diarrhea. And when the wounded arrived, whether it was 40 or 400 or 1,000, no one had the time or the energy to show an inexperienced nurse what to do. It was on-the-job training of the most chaotic variety. And quite frankly, not all of them made it. Hundreds of women didn't last a month. It just wasn't for everyone. Some found they didn't have the temperament or a strong enough stomach to do the work. Some of them became ill, catching illnesses from the men they nursed. But the women who lasted learned quickly. The most obvious skill they needed to learn, the one they took the most pride in mastering, was how to dress and bandage wound. Changing a soiled bandage and putting on a clean one isn't as easy as it might sound. And we get a really good description of what this was like from a woman named Elmira Powers, who was a 30-something school teacher who worked as a nurse at Jefferson General Hospital in Jeffersonville, Indiana. One of her first jobs after she arrived was to hold on to a soldier's arm while a more senior nurse changed the dressing. Now, the wound had previously been packed with bromine-soaked oakum. And oakum is a tar, it's a material that's made by picking apart, whoops, a tarred row. Um, a lot of doctors of the period preferred it to cotton lint for dressing a wound. It was more absorbent and they also believed that the tar in the rope helped limit decay of flesh in a wound. So the wound has previously been packed with oakum. Now it's time to take it off. So Powers supported the soldier's arm by the elbow, and it was sw swollen and red and hot to the touch and had streaks of red running up and down 
that would tell a modern observer that that wound was probably infected. The senior nurse had pinchers, and she had to take the pinchers and puck, pick off all the fibers of pus-soaked oakum off the wound. And once she'd gotten all of that clear, she had to go around the edges and pick off any dead flesh. And according to Powers, she was doing all right until the soldier began to cry for mercy and his arm began to tremble in her hand. And at that point, she was afraid that they might have a second patient to take care of if she stayed in the hospital tent. So she dropped the soldier's arm and she ran for the tent opening. And after she'd been outside in the fresh air for a couple minutes and was sure she wasn't going to pass out, she went back in. This is how she ended her letter. It will be necessary to imbibe a little more of the heroic before I can be of much use in an operation. All laughed at me, even the patient. But it isn't expected that a Yankee school ma'am can, can be transformed into a, dissect, a dissecting surgeon in a minute. Guess it'll take about a fortnight. Not all nursing skills were that tangible. One of the things the nurses learned was how to stand up for themselves and for their patients. You know, as a group, nurses were committed to caring for soldiers as individuals. And they often complained that the doctors just saw them as cases rather than as people. Now, in all fairness, the doctors had a very different experience of dealing with the patients. Um, they had to see a lot of men in a very short period of time. Nurses, though, had a very different experience. Their work occurred on a more intimate schedule. Um, in fact, one nurse said that her real work began when her official day was over. They spent time in the wards. They soothed men to sleep. They read to them. They listened to their stories. They helped them write letters home to their parents, their pastors, their siblings, their wives, their old friends, their sweethearts. In fact, at one point, von Olnhausen was writing so many letters for patients that in her own letter home, she said that if she'd known that was going to be part of the job, she would never have volunteered. As a result of all of this, nurses came to know their patients as people. And they came to see themselves as advocates for their patients in a system where advocates were sorely needed. And as advocates, nurses fought with doctors and hospital stewards over details of diet, over who would control the all-important boxes of luxuries that came from the ladies' aid societies, sometimes over the very nature of patient care. Some of them exposed cases of corruption, greed, and neglect. Sometimes they fought to keep patients alive long after doctors had given up on them. And at least a few reached the conclusion, maybe with some truth, that they could run the hospital better than the men in charge. This is Catherine Prescott Wormley. Um, she served first on the Sanitary Commission transport ships and later was the matron for a hospital for convalescent soldiers. She summed up the feelings of many women who were frustrated by the failures of the system when she wrote, I should like to have charge of a hospital now. I could make it march if only I had hold of some of the administrative power. And she underlined power. The Civil War was a pivotal experience for many of the women who served as nurses whether it was for three weeks or three years. For many of them, it was their first time away from family and home, their first step outside the narrow framework of what society expected of them. They didn't just learn new skills. They often learned new confidence. Over and over in their letters home and later in their memoirs, they expressed deep satisfaction with the work and the way of life even if they were complaining bitterly in the next sentence. Wormley, again, claimed to speak for Army nurses as a whole when she said, we all know in our hearts 
It is thorough enjoyment to be here. It is life, in short, and we wouldn't be anywhere else for anything in the world. This is Emily Parsons. She nursed for two years, despite the fact that she was lame, blind in one eye, and partially deaf. She took Wormley's sentiment one step further and wrote home, I should like to live so all the rest of my life. She didn't, of course. Parsons, like most of the women, went home at war's end. Nursing had been a temporary part of their lives, just like being a soldier was a temporary part of the lives of most of the men who served in the war. They went home and they stepped back into their old roles as daughters, seamstresses, school teachers, wives, and sometimes as reformers. I've come to believe that their role of, as reformers after the war is the most important part of their story. You know, for many years, I was fascinated by the women who disguised themselves as men and enlisted to fight. But as I came to know more about the stories of the women who volunteered as nurses, I've come to realize they played a far more important role in shaping America after the war than the several hundred women who fought, no matter how bravely. Many of the nurses used their newfound experience at organizing and at elbowing their way through bureaucracies to help change the world. Cornelia Hancock, for instance, that young Quaker woman who worked at Gettysburg, she started a school for the children of former slaves in South Carolina. Other former nurses were active in building hospitals for women and children and reforming prisons and asylum and helping settle unemployed veterans on uh, farmland in the West. They set up relief funds for war widows and orphans and organized programs, for, I already said that, sorry, and provided vocational training for girls. Some of them became active in the labor movement, the women's rights movement, the temperance movement, and a few of them were actually able to use their experience as a springboard to national leadership roles. They founded groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the American Red Cross. If you look at an American reform movement in the 20 or 30 or even 40 years after 1865, local or national, large or small, the odds are good you're going to find a Civil War nurse or two right in the middle of things. One thing very few of them did after the war was work as a nurse. But if they didn't continue to work as nurses after the war, their collective experience in the war convinced Americans that nursing was a respectable job for a woman. In 1868, the American Medical Association recommended the general hospitals start training schools for nurses. And it was really a two-edged response to the success of the women who nursed in the Civil War. On the one hand, the AMA declared that it was important to have skilled nurses in hospitals, which is a big change in their position. On the other hand, they also made it clear that they really didn't want to have another group of untrained, uncontrollable volunteer nurses in case of another war. By 1880, there were 15 nursing schools in the United States. By 1900, there were 432. Before the Civil War, there were none. Nursing became a skilled profession. And I think this change can best be illustrated by an anecdote from 1903, almost 40 years after the end of the war. In June of that year, the American Nurses Association had its sixth annual convention. And at one point in their meeting, the organization's president announced that there was another group of nurses meeting in the building, women who had nursed in the Civil War. And she suggested it would be appropriate if their organization do something to honor those older nurses. And a nurse from the floor immediately asked to speak and suggested that they invite the Civil War nurses to come to the afternoon sessions of the meeting. Personally, I think this was a setup. 
because the next speaker was Mary Livermore, a Civil War nurse who went on to become a national leader of the women's suffrage movement. Livermore rose to welcoming applause, and she began her address with a tribute from the older nurses to the new. A congregation of trained women nurses, something that in my earlier days I never expected to see and that I always felt would be a desirable thing to accomplish. She went on to say what some of the younger women in the room may have been thinking. The women whom you've invited to meet with you are wrecks only, simply driftwood left from the Civil War. But, she reminded them, they had a great work to do without any of the advantages that you would have if you were to take their place today. Their legacy stood before her. Trained nurses who could be called to duty in case of another war. Nurses, she said, who know what to do and how to do it, who have learned to obey and learned when they must depart from instructions. From her perspective, the nurses who stood before her were the most important thing to happen for the status of women in society in the previous 50 years, a direct result of the women who nursed in the American Civil War. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm happy to take questions as long as you've got questions or my voice holds out. Okay. I'll start off. Um, what was your experience and what you have researched so far regarding um, the nursing nun orders, like the Sisters of Mercy and so forth? Um, there were several hundred nuns who nursed, and in fact, they were an exception to the women not nursing reality. Um, but they really were not trained nurses as such. They had not gone, they had not learned to work medically quite yet. But they, the doctors often preferred them if they could get them. Um, and they preferred them because they were used to following instructions. <laughs> um, they were used to working as a unit. They were used to being part of the team. Um, the the strong-minded middle-aged women that Dix um, recruited were a little less amenable to following instructions, particularly when they didn't think they made sense. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. No, um, and Dix gradually lost control of the situation so that she was running nurses and was able to recruit nurses, but over time, surgeons began to be able to recruit nurses on their own as well. So you know, there, was, there was no hierarchy, there was no system. There were nurses who, after the war, became doctors. Um, and there was one, in fact, who was in Indiana, who she and her husband became doctors at the same time and had a practice in Indiana for a long time. Um, certainly, there were women nurses. It was actually easier to get an education as a woman, as a doctor, than it was as a nurse. Um, and, that, and it wasn't easy to get, get it trained as a doctor. The only exception to that would be Dr. Mary Walker, who was already a doctor and who managed to bludgeon her way in to being a, an army surgeon. And there will actually be a biography of her coming out in March or April of this year. Um, so if she's something you're interested in, keep your eyes out. Was there a similar experience in Britain the Korean War, and, uh, as far as the social uh, fallout of this corps, there was, and actually Florence Nightingale was very responsible for that because she founded a school to train nurses, and then other schools spun off from that, so that you were already having women training as nurses, 
in Britain before the Civil War, but not American women trained. Okay. Could you tell us what the Confederates did? Sure. Um, the Confederates' situation was different, obviously, in some st substantial ways. And part of it was the, the two big social issues that shaped women like Dix and von Ollenhausen didn't happen. One was the Great Awakening, which was this massive reform movement in the North, and the other was the urbanization. So you didn't get this group of middle class, reform-minded women in the South the way you did in the North. What you did have were elite women who were basically used to running smaller, not sm so small buildings, businesses on plantations, and a number of them chose to found hospitals of their own, or in at least one case, and unfortunately I've forgotten the woman's name, she basically wrote to the governor of her state and said, I am coming and bringing nurses and we're taking over this hospital. Um, so you had that level. Those women tended to be what we would think of as nursing supervisors these days. And in fact, the Confederate Senate ran a survey of nursing care when in about 1862, they're trying, early in the war, they're trying to make some sense of hospital care and they discovered that the mortality rate in hospitals that were run by women was 5% and the mortality rate in hospitals run by men was 10% and basically said, so we need to make room for women in our hospitals. Again, that's at the supervisor level. At the, in the floor, on the ground level, the women who are actually cleaning patients and changing bedpans, it's slaves. Okay, um, uh, and obviously I know more about women here. That uh, so I suspect you all know more about the use of blacks, black men as soldiers or as laborers than I do. Um, in the North, black women tended to be categorized as laundresses rather than as nurses, even if they were doing the exact same work. Um, and in fact, as the war progressed, and moved further south, the number of black women who became nurses, the percentage became much higher because they were coming to the Union camps for safety. Um, in the south, they were often being hired out or volunteered as nurses. She just maintained her higher position. She was never a nurse. And she, after the war, went back to the kind of reform work she'd been doing before and was glad to do it, I think. Anyone else? Behind you. How much mortality rate did the nurses have, either by exhaustion or attrition to their work? You know, I can't give you an exact percentage, but there was no doubt that it was a serious problem. Um, the most well known instance of that is Louisa May Alcott, who she and her supervisor both caught an illness from six men that they were nursing. Her supervisor died. Um, Alcott was so ill that her father came and got her, and she never really recovered her health. And that was not uncommon. In fact, Mary Finney ended up getting very ill twice and having to be invalided out and then coming back. Any more? Well, no further questions. Pamela, we thank you a lot. Present you with the Certificate of Honor by the G Order of the General Staff of the Civil War Roundtable of Milwaukee. This award is presented to Pamela Toller for furthering our understanding of the causes and consequences of the American Civil War, the watershed event in our nation's history. Oh, thank and you so much. <laughs> yes, and don't shake my hand. And thank you all so much for having me here. Don't go away, there's more. Uh, for those of you who, haven't, who have heard me, and even for those of you who haven't, um, the Civil War Roundtable of Milwaukee, through the good graces of a couple of sons of veterans of the Iron Brigade, 
is the custodian organization of the Iron Brigade Association formed by the veterans in the 1880s. As such, it gives me great pleasure on behalf of the association to present this pin signifying membership in the Iron Brigade Association to Pam Tall. You don't want to shake my hand. I've got I a call. I don't care. Okay. okay. Thank you. We'll thank do that. you. Lovely. Well, thank you all. Two items? Yes, sir, way in the back. 